Now, this is physics 101. What we're going to study generally in this course is Newton's laws and mechanics. I think a lot of you are already in the physics department, so I don't have to justify why you take this course, right? How many physicists are there here? Excellent. How many chemists? Great. How about engineers? OK. Anyone from architecture? Just two. OK. Anyone who I haven't mentioned, this department? OK. So basically, all of you are, all of you have some aspiration to be a scientist or an engineer, this course. And what started this whole uh, adventure, if you want, the adventure of science, is what Newton did. Okay, Newton's laws. And what he actually showed the world is that if you use mathematics to describe nature, come on in, if you use mathematics to describe nature, you actually are using the correct language. Mathematics apparently is the language to describe nature. You can write physical laws which are obeyed regardless of where you are. Earth's motion around the sun can be explained by the same equations for an apple to fall from the tree. That was the great discovery of Newton. He said there are universal laws which apply everywhere. So what we're going to do this term is quite exciting. We're going to study mechanics. We're going to understand these universal laws of motion. All right? So let me go quickly through the syllabus. This week we'll have some introduction. We'll talk about how to express numbers. We're going to talk about how to measure things, how to represent them. And then we'll study talking about motion. Practically until the first midterm exam, we're going to study Newton's laws. OK, we'll talk about what they are, how to describe simple cases of motion. After first midterm, we'll talk about gravitation. And then we're going to reformulate Newton's laws in terms of conservation laws. We're going to talk about why, what energy is and why it's conserved, and why this quantity helps us. Then we're going to talk about momentum, another conserved quantity. Then we're going to study rotational motion and another conserved quantity called angular momentum. And finally, the last chapter is oscillations. That's going to be it. Now, here's the textbook. Okay. As you see, it's a quite heavy textbook. Uh, now, unfortunately, you're going to, we're going to use a textbook-based homework system, which means you actually have to buy a copy of this homework, uh, this textbook to be able to register to the homework site. Okay? The details about how you're going to do this registration is inside the syllabus. I'm not going to go over this. Let me also tell you one very important fact. There are 15 different sections of this course. About 800 students are taking this course, okay? Which means there are 14 other lecturers like me, okay? And the nice thing is that the only thing that changes from one section to the other is the lecturer. Everything else, the exams, the lab, okay? And grading is done centrally. So there is one person who coordinates this course. His name is Ahmed Erish, Professor Ahmed Erish. Okay. Any questions you have about the course, I'm not the guy to talk to. If you come to me, I'll say, ask the coordinator all the time. Okay. So about the running of the course, Ahmed Erish is responsible. About the lectures in this room, I'm responsible. All right? Still feel free to come and ask me questions. I can, in the worst cases, I'll tell you to go to Ahmet Erish, OK? Are the groups uh, recording? No, this is the only section that's being recorded, OK? Which is not a good thing in some respects, and it's OK in some other respects, OK? Now, what else? Let's go to something that's important for students, grading. So there are. Two midterm exams and one final exam, all of them is 20%. All right. 
There is lab work, which is also 20%. Now, labs will start certainly not this week, but I think next week. Okay. Uh, how many of you have taken lab before? If you have taken the lab before and passed it, you don't have to take the lab again. You can actually apply for uh, being exempt from this terms lab. Okay. But you do it as soon as possible. Make sure. I, I don't want to see someone at the end of the term saying, hey, I was exempt, but didn't apply. That causes a lot of problems. Homework is 10%. Most of the uh, syllabus actually deals with how you can log on to this mastering physics site and uh, do your homeworks there. All right? It's going to be centrally graded. Another 10% is quizzes. And that's actually also one more thing that changes from section to section. In my section, there will be a quiz every lecture day, including today. So you will actually have 28 quizzes throughout this term. There are 14 weeks, 28 lecture days. So on every we, our lectures are on Monday and Thursday. Every Monday there will be a quiz. Every Thursday there will be a quiz. Okay, and that constitutes 10% of the grade. So I mean, one quiz by itself is not important, but if you miss enough of them, that's going to be quite important. All right? Another question? Yes. On whatever I'm going to see if it, OK? I'll determine the time again. So. Good. Uh, how do we grade? How do we determine the letter grades? The answer is we don't. There is a nice computer program that does it. All of your grades are entered into this uh, program. So you have 100% you know, of the grade possible. And the computer program has these letter bins. So if you uh, get exactly AD5, you'll get an A. What happens if it's 84.99? A minus. So yes. We roll over to two significant figures, and we're going to discuss what that means today. Okay, what significant figures mean today? So, and in math, do you remember the symbol? What's the square bracket as opposed to the parentheses? Square means included. It means seventy is not included. Okay, so that's what our grading scheme means. So this is not graded on a curve. This is a what's called a catalog course, whatever lecture, whatever letter grade you're going to get, is only determined by your own performance in the course. OK? Bill Kent has a strange grade called FZ. Uh, what does that mean? It means if your midterm performance is not enough, you're not accepted to the final. You automatically fail the course without taking the final. I see a lot of scared people. <laughs> okay. If you get an FC grade, you fail the course. That's you have to take it again. Okay. And it's uh, the nice thing is it's not it's actually a very hard grade to get. I mean, you really have to work for it. Okay. For example, if the average of midterm one and midterm two is below 30. You get 15 from the first midterm over, over, out of 100 and 20 for the second midterm. We say, hey, do not even bother to show up for the final, OK? You're going to have to repeat this course. Similarly, if you cannot pass the lab, the passing grade for the lab is 60 out of 100, then you'll have to repeat the course. You can pass the lab and fail the course. That's another thing. Then you're going, when you take it again, you don't have to pass the lab again. There are two midterms. One is quite soon, actually, in five weeks, on the 22nd of October. And the second midterm is in December. And our final is around New Year. It's not exactly set yet. But I think in maybe 
second or third year of second or third day of next year is going to be our finals. Okay. There is a lot of information about exams. You should read it. I'm going to send this again before the exam. Quizzes I talked about, homework. There is enough information on the syllabus. Another thing is Moodle. Now, Moodle is a program BitCant uses for sharing course-related material. Particularly for this section, what I'll do is I'll actually use a tablet PC for my lecture notes. And at the end of every week, I share my lecture notes in PDF format using Moodle. Okay, So learn how to do that. And our lecture is also recorded. We are very lucky in that respect. Our lectures will become available within two to three weeks after this week. So hopefully before the exam, you can both look at the lecture notes and review the lecture from, the, from YouTube. At this point, I am almost tempted to say that you don't need to come to class. That's a joke. Laugh at my jokes. That's the most important, <laughs> mo most important thing about this, this uh, section. Please, please attend the course. I mean, you see, there is, I did not uh, actually, we did not assign a grade to attendance. But we have studied the correlation between success in physics 101 and 102 and attendance. And it's amazing. Okay, we, we've looked at two things. One of them is most of the students here come from this university entrance exam, right? So you can look at the, their placement in the university entrance exam and their physics 101 grade to see if there is any correlation. I, maybe you can think, oh, if this guy is within the first 10,000 students, he'll do well in physics 101. It turns out there is almost no correlation. Okay. Someone coming from 90,000 does as well as someone coming from the first 10,000. That's very strange. It actually shows us that this university entrance examination is not a very good examination. Okay. But one thing is a lot has a lot of correlation with the physics 101 grade, and that's attendance to the course. There is almost no one who gets an FZ and attends all the courses, all the lectures. So please, uh, it may seem strange, right? I mean, the same guy is talking on YouTube. The same lecture notes are available on Moodle. Why should I come to the course? And the interesting thing to realize here is that it's not that I am actually talking here about physics that makes you learn. It's that you. When you're in the classroom, even if you're distracted, even if you're thinking about your boyfriend, I don't know, you're thinking about uh, God, whatever you're thinking about, some of the time spent in this lecture, you're actually thinking about physics. And the only way to learn any topic is to actually think about it. That's why we give homeworks. That's why I give quizzes. I want you to be an active participant here by thinking about the subject at hand. All right? Good. Recitations, uh, the third hour, so 8.40 hour on Thursdays is our recitation section. What's a recitation section? Let me write the recitations are by Mr. Emre Akatürk. So, not the second hour, third hour every week. On Thursdays, 8.40. It's going to be in this classroom. What happens in the recitations? Emre will come here with a fixed set of problems, around five problems every week, which are about the topics of this week. and are usually previous exam questions. So attending, I know it's very hard to wake up at 8.40. It will get progressively harder as we go into the term. But try to come to Emre's recitations. He's also, a, although he's just a PhD student, he hasn't finished his doctorate yet, he's very able 
He's also very easy to talk to. Okay. Uh, he's an excellent assistant. So come to Emre Akatürk's uh, recitations. Right? Any other things we have to cover? Not really. Uh, maybe a few words about the textbook. Now, there are many almost equivalent textbooks about Physics 101. So we had to decide which one to use. And we chose this Gian Colley's book for mainly two things. One is it's actually easy to read. Okay. Really, I know that our selection system for university, this university entrance exam, does not prepare you to read long texts. Okay. Almost all of you can be classified to have attention deficit disorder. Okay. So I mean, when I show the book, most of you have large eyes and see. I mean, how can a big, how can we read this book? So pretty much we are going to cover, yeah, the first 450 pages of this book. Okay, Mister. So it's not too bad, not the whole book. Okay, but uh, still, it's a book you can read, and that that's saying a lot. Okay, most textbooks in physics, in chemistry, you'll see they are not readable. They are like encyclopedias. If you know something, if you want to learn, you really have to apply yourself to the book. This is just the opposite. You can actually read the book. So I like the book. There are lots of examples at the end of each chapter. So if you're not feeling comfortable with any chapter, you can actually solve those examples. One more thing. On Fridays, eight forty to ten thirty is my office hours. My office is in the SA building. It's two two seven. Now, what does that mean, office hours? First of all. I actually guarantee that I'll be in my office at those hours. Okay. Second thing is, as an undergraduate student, you have the precedence. If you actually come at another time to my office, you're welcome to, by the way, to ask me questions. If I'm busy doing something or if I'm talking to a master's student, to a PhD student, to another faculty member, I'll tell you to wait. And sometimes those waits can go on a few hours. I'm generally quite busy. Or I may be away. I have some assignments at Tubitak at other places. I may not be in the office. But Fridays at 8.40 till 10.30 are my office hours. I'll be there. I'm ready for you. Please use that resource. Somehow, in Turkey, the only time I actually get students in my office is right before the exam. Okay. So that the, the Friday before the exam, a lot of students come. And one week before that, no one shows up. Okay. And that was actually quite, quite interesting. Uh, for a while, I was teaching in the United States. At each of my office hours, I had 10 students coming and asking me questions. And it wasn't even a Physics 101 course. It was a uh, later years, fourth year course. Okay. So this is a good resource. Please use it. Okay. Please come to my office, ask me questions. There are no stupid questions. You can ask me anything about the course, anything you don't understand. Right? Now, I think I've actually covered uh, oh, one more thing about the quizzes. The quizzes will be in class. You can use your lecture notes, and you can use your book. You can use your phone. You can look at things on the internet. The only thing I do not allow is collaboration. You cannot look at what your friend next to you do, is doing. You cannot talk to each other. Okay. And uh, I'm very serious about t cheating. This maybe for most of you, this is the first year at Bilkent. So Bilkent is extremely serious about uh, cheating. Uh, disciplinary action is <laughs> regularly taken and apply to its fullest extent. All of 
your exams, midterm exams, are going to be monitored by a video camera. Okay, we we bring it to the class. It's not here right now. Okay, so uh, and actually we actually pay some undergraduate students to watch the exam after. <laughs> so, okay, so they go watch and say maybe these two guys around uh, the 15th minute they talk to each other. So we, we are very serious about that. Okay, and I think you'll actually refrain from doing such things. No, no. I mean, uh, that's my hope at least. Now, any questions? Yes. Uh, we have some laboratory hours scheduled for tomorrow, uh, but there is no classroom. Will that be announced, or is there? The the all the labs are in the first floor of the physics building. Okay, so that's the place, and your labs will not start this week. They'll probably start next week. It's going to be announced. So we just have uh, like no classes tomorrow. Yes, you don't have you don't have classes at the tower. Yes. You have to speak up. Oh, that's an excellent question. Okay. The greatest th I mean you can say that, hey, I know all these topics. Okay. Maybe except angular momentum and oscillations. The most important thing we are going to do here is we'll actually do it with proper mathematics. We're going to use calculus, which means we're going to use derivatives, we're going to use integrals, okay? And that's actually the way to learn and understand physics. And it's not harder. Please do not, I see some very scared faces. You don't have to be scared. We'll do it nicely, and this is an excellent way to apply the knowledge you learn in math to a real life situation. The second thing is, in our high school systems, I know there are some international students which come from very different high school systems, but in our high school system, the only thing that's valued is to be able to answer a question within a minute, or at least two minutes, and you're not supposed to do any calculations, you just have to mark the correct answer, multiple choice. That does terrible damage to you. I can't, I mean, you don't know how damaged you are right now. You'll see in the first midterm that you'll actually have to answer a one question, just one question, in half an hour. So what do you have to do? You have to read the whole paragraph. You have to think. That's terrible. I, you're not trained to think. You know, there is the, the cortex, the outer brain, and then there is the reptile brain in, okay, inside that. Most of you are answering your uh, physics questions from your reptilian, reptilian brain. You don't think about it. It's, it's a reflex. Now we have to change that. You actually have to think. You have to use your cortex to answer questions. You have to think about it. You have to apply the correct formula. This is one course where you cannot do, you cannot memorize things and pass the course. <coughs> so that causes a lot of problems. You actually have to understand. You have to understand what Newton's third law means. You cannot just answer all kinds of problems that can arise from Newton's third law. I'll, I'll be able to find the problem which is not there. All right? So, any other questions? Yes? You said that uh, we have to have calculus to actually understand this, right? Because no, we are going to develop that very, very slowly. I'm sure all of you are taking a parallel course in calculus. Right? How many of you know how to take a derivative? Anyone who hasn't heard or applied a derivative before? No? Maybe one or two? No? Okay, so I mean, I am going to develop the derivatives today, but we're going to do it very gently, very slowly, okay? So you don't have to panic. Any other questions? No? Okay. So let's start with our material. First, a few things which you probably know, but I should still mention is let's talk about measurement. Okay. 
what Newton did, what his greatest contribution was not really finding this equations of motion. What he proved was that really we have to use measurement and mathematics to describe nature. There were philosophers before Newton who worried about motion. Aristotle worried about motion. He wrote a big book about it. However, he did not use mathematics. What he said was he was, he said, okay, when I throw a stone, it wants to stop. That's why it stops. So that the logic was ascribing some, you know, livelihood to inanimate objects, expressing nature in terms of wants and needs and other things. And that, you know, people pretty much used the same ideas until maybe Galileo and certainly even at Newton's times, people thought there should be a natural philosophy. They, you should think about motion, you should think about how stars move, how planets move. But they never used math. That's the critical thing. And Newton said, no, no, no. We have to measure things. We have to describe everything in terms of mathematics. And at the end of the day, when you actually make a prediction, you have to compare it with measurement. But there are very critical aspects of measurement. The first thing we actually have to understand about measurement is every measurement carries an uncertainty. What does that mean? Well, you actually intuitively know what that means. So this morning, I stepped on the balance to see how much I weigh this morning. I read something like this, 83.4. Hmm. So this is, here are my feet. OK, so you understand what this is, my balance. Now, there are, there's a critical issue here. So my weight is 83.4. Hmm. Can I really say it's just 83.4? Well, obviously, if it's 83.48, my balance is probably not good enough to detect that. And actually, if you look at the, read the instruction book, it says certainty up to 0 0.1. So maybe what I should say is that my weight is 83.4 plus or minus 0.1. Okay. It's not because I'm a cheap guy and I actually bought a bad uh, balance, OK? Every measurement has a uncertainty associated with the machinery. And if you actually, some of you are physicists who are going to take quantum mechanics, you will see there are even inherent uncertainties in nature, but that's a topic for the third year or the fourth year. Nonetheless, every measurement carries an uncertainty. Now, how do we deal with this when we represent numbers? I also missed something very important here. I said 83.4 plus minus 01, but what am I comparing this to? Okay, what are the units? So units are extremely important. If I was just going to compare my weight with myself all the time, I could have any kind of unit I want. And actually, for a long, very long time, there were no fixed system of units. Okay. In the Ottoman Empire, the unit for weight was okka. Okay. 
Okay, that's fine. You can have a different set of units. But the Oka in Istanbul was not the Oka in Cairo. Even if you have two merchants in Istanbul, they use different Okkas. Okay? That's terrible. And I cannot do science with that. Then I would not be able to compare my measurement with the measurement done in the United States. What is needed is a system of units that actually forms the basis of measurement. And in the system of units we actually use, we always give out, whenever I actually quote a number, I always quote it with whatever units I am using. Okay? And for mass, that unit is kilogram. Now, here is something which may be a little bit surprises, surprising to you. Okay. There are infinitely many physical quantities you can think of. For example, let's talk about mechanics. Maybe you remember from high school there is momentum. Okay. There is pressure. There is uh, kinetic energy. Do I need to invent units for all of them? Do I need to define units so that everyone agrees on the same measurement for kinetic energy, for example? It turns out nature is much kinder. There are, for mechanics, there are only three basic units that you need to define. If you actually know how to measure time, length, and mass, these are the basic units. If we agree on definition of all these three, then we can actually agree on the measurement of all physical quantities related to mechanics. Now, here's a controversial question. Why is this three? Why are there just three basic units? This is for, the, for those of you who are interested in, I'm not going to take any answers. Okay, I just want you to think about this. Does it have anything to do with that we are living in three space dimensions? For example, that's one thing I want you to think about. Okay? Hmm? The question is why do why are there only three basic units for mechanics? Why don't I have another unit I need to define? Because I'm claiming something very interesting. I'm saying I will measure time in seconds, length in meters, and mass in kilograms. And anything else, any other physical quantity related to mechanics, I can express in terms of just these three basic quantities. For example, what did I say? I said momentum. We're going to see what this is. Momentum. When I use a bracket like this, momentum is, do you know what was the definition of momentum? Okay, it's going to be mass times velocity, which is going to be kilogram meters per second. It's expressed in terms of just these three basic units. Similarly, what is kinetic energy? It's going to be kilogram meter square per second square. Because I remember it's one half mv square. That's how I say. Question. Excellent question. We are going to see you're right. Temperature is defined in terms of Kelvin. It turns out we need one more constant. Okay. But that's going to be a constant which relates temperature 
is a form of energy. Temperature we're going to see is that just the average kinetic energy of molecules. So what will happen is that we're going to actually define a new constant, Boltzmann constant. Then we can, instead of Kelvin, we can actually use Joule to describe that. Okay, But it's another complexity, and we're not going to deal with temperature in this course. That's why we need only three units. But that's excellent. Another thing we're going to need in physics 102 will be the electric charge. Okay, That will provide an other basic unit that we have to take care of. Okay. But now, all of these other things, these are called derived units. Okay. Even if we give them a name, for example, we'll sometimes give a name to the unit for force. It's going to be Newtons. But that's just a shorthand. What Newtons is a kilogram meter per second square. Okay. All of these other units. For pressure, it's Pascal, but Pascal is just force per unit area, newtons per meter square. So it's kilogram divided by meter divided by time second square. Okay. So this is actually something interesting about nature. It requires deeper thought. It requires and the concept of conserved quantities. Maybe I will come back to this at the very end of the course, Okay, at the last lecture. We'll talk about why there are three basic units for mechanics. Good. Now, as I said, for a long time, people actually had different units. In Ottoman Empire, it was the Oka. In, the, uh, in London, in the British Empire, they had imperial units. And that actually had something really funny, at least in the Middle Ages. There is the unit of feet. Maybe you actually heard about it. That was really the length of the king's feet. So the king died, a new king comes, feet changes. Similarly, an arm gives you a yard, something like that. That's a terrible way to fix things. Okay? Question? Well, so imperial units has changed a lot over the years. We can't maybe talk about that. But maybe we shouldn't, right? It's a terrible thing to fix units on a person. It's, you know, actually what we want is something universal. How can we actually find a universal way of describing these units? The first effort was after French Revolution. People said, hey, this is uh, terrible, the way we are actually using units. Let's convene together. Let's actually decide on units. They've come up with the metric system. The first way, let's start with time. Let's start with the second. The first definition is that, hey, they said, Earth's rotation around itself, so a day is something constant. It's measurable everywhere on Earth. So why don't I actually divide a day into 24 equal hours, each hour into 60 equals minutes, and each minute into 60 seconds. And that will be my definition of time. So, OK, so that was the first definition. But now I'll actually give you, and I actually have to read this. You'll see why. I'll give you the definition of second. Second is the time required for nine billion one hundred and ninety two million six. 31,770 oscillations of 
cesium atoms fundamental excitation. Seems very strange, right? I mean, why would you base your unit on something like this? Well, because you have actually cesium atoms everywhere. If you have a simple laboratory, you can actually, using light, you can measure these oscillations of the cesium atom. So by just having a good laser and some cesium at your hand, you can do a very precise measurement of a second. Now the measurement of the second is so precise that the error in atomic clocks is one part in 10 to 15. What does that mean? It means that if I actually started my atomic clock at the Big Bang, it will be off only by one minute over all the time that passed. So it's extremely accurate. Now, it turns out there is right now a project, a, a lot of money that's being spent on improving the accuracy. That's the goal, accuracy, to one part in 10 to 18. Do you have any idea why people actually want to have so precise clocks? It's obviously not coming to appointments on time, right? It's, it's not. Yes. Nope. That's one, obviously, the, pre the more precision you actually have in time measurement, you'll have other precisions in other measurements. And about that, yes, again? Uh, no, nope. no. Nope. It's actually something very useful, yes. Improvement of what? Of the measurement of time. Yes, that's the, but I mean, if we actually, that's what we want to do. But why do we want to do that? There is, I'm telling you, a lot of companies are actually pouring money into this research. Why would you actually want to improve measurement of time with more accuracy? How can you make money out of that? Technology. Which technology? There is a specific One technology. Person. No, it's not. How many of you have smartphones? Like almost everyone. Do you use Google Maps or any other program which uses GPS, Global Positioning System? How does GPS work? There are satellites around Earth. And do you know what those satellites have? These satellites actually have very precise clocks in them. They just actually announce the time. And what your smartphone does is it actually sees four of those satellites. And they, it sees different times from each one of them. And says, hey, this guy is so far away. That guy is so far away. That guy is for." So it actually maps four spheres. Four spheres intersect only at one point. So it actually tells you where you're on Earth using these four satellites. What's the precision of your GPS? Even if you buy the best GPS out there, the precision is almost a meter, OK? Maybe half a meter, the best technology, military technology. Now, what happens if I actually improve the measurement of time by, a, by uh, 1,000? One part in 10 to 18, if I go to there, it means I've reduced the uncertainty in my time measurement. I have reduced the uncertainty in my length measurement, right? Because time for the signal to come from the satellite to me is just speed of light times this uncertainty in time measurement, which means GPS now can have one millimeter of accuracy. Why would you want GPS to have one millimeter of accuracy? For self-driving cars, for planes that can land themselves just using GPS. So that's why people actually want to improve the 
measurement of time. Okay? Let's take a 10-minute break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the other units.